Um, thank you very much, Alice. And thank you for inviting me to your seminar um, with all these distinguished people. Uh, I really look forward to a discussion here about my paper. Um, as Alice indicated, um, I've kind of danced around lots of topics uh, related to late antiquity and the early Middle Ages. And uh, right now I'm obsessed with Visigoths and for a long time have been obsessed with um, slavery. So if you put those together, that's kind of what I'm gonna talk about today. And I'm, I'm gonna share a PowerPoint here. Mine will be more of a presentation than a formal lecture. Um, and I'll explain a bit about why that's the case as we get going. Um, so if I can, there, can everyone see the PowerPoint? Good, okay. So um, the, uh, as Alice explained, I'm currently working on a translation and commentary for the Translated Text for Historians series um, uh, in collaboration with Damian Fernandez, who teaches at Northern Illinois University. Um, uh, and uh, this translation will be of the Visigothic Law Code um, and will uh, include fairly extensive commentary. The translation is ready um, apart from maybe some minor changes, but the commentary is taking us more time than we thought because it really is a, an incredibly rich source and full of problems. And among those um, is the problem of slavery. I had already written an article about this that you'll see as kind of the last item in this list. But this list is intended as a kind of um, a uh, effort to lay out maybe the very broadest lines about how people have thought about um, medieval, early medieval slavery and then uh, slavery in the Visigothic world as well. And um, if we think about kind of the, a progress from um, Marxist historical materialist narrative that posits a decline of slavery and slaveholding in the post-Roman world as states contract and peasants then, uh, and, and then serfs replace slaves as the primary agricultural producers, the first person that comes to mind um, is Chris Wickham's framing of the early Middle Ages, who has very much this picture. Um, we also, um, and I'm only putting one source here, but there, there's um, Barbara and Vigil's uh, um, Spanish uh, book written already in the 1970s um, that basically takes the same approach from a really more class, classical uh, Marxist perspective. There's a, the response to that in the sort of French social historical narrative approach that posits a continuation of slavery into the early medieval West, um, giving way to serfdom only maybe beginning in the 10th century or beyond. And here, uh, I think the most important uh, voice is that of Pierre Bonassi from slavery to feudalism in Southwestern Europe. More recently, there's been the approach of what I call neo-capitalist narratives that argued that, that the classical, the late Roman and the Carolingian economic flourish is dependent on slavery while positing a marked drop in economic performance and the practice of slavery in the fifth through eighth centuries. Um, and here I could speak of Kyle Harper, but choose to speak um, of uh, uh, Michael McCormick, who, who works later, we'll say, and touches on the Visigoths in a way that, uh, that um, uh, Harper does not. And then um, our own Alice Rio, I say that because she's in our community, not because she's my colleague, um, but her um, wonderful book on slavery after Rome, I think has really reframed the question in more complex ways. Um, and that, that thinks about, first of all, regional variation, uh, but also a, lo a loss of kind of firm boundaries around the notion of free and slave that allows for individuals to sort of commoditize their individual freedom um, as a way of surviving or operating um, in the variegated economies that we find in the early Middle Ages. I have done this article um, in a volume called Slavery in the, in the Late Antique World, um, edited by Chris DeWitt and my Estina Carlos and Bela Volanto, um, that um, attempts just an overview of slavery in the Visigothic period. That article's um, in proof, so it's close to being out. But a lot of what I'll say um, relates back to that article. And one of the things that I point out is just the number of times that slave words and you can see from my sort of third column over, I'm putting slaves in inverted commas for the moment, but words like mancipia, servi, anchilai, that they occur in the Visigothic law code. So here we're talking about what is often called the Liber Judiciorum um, or the Legis Visigothorum. And um, it has divided into 12 books. And what you see here uh, in number form are the number of titles and chapters in each book. And then the number of titles or chapters that mention slave words, um, and then the percentage of titles and chapters that mention slave words. And you can see from the bottom total column um, that 81% of the um, titles 
in the code and 40% of the chapters in the code include some reference to Munkipia Servi or Anchilai. So a remarkably high number, honestly. And that does have to be one to wonder whether a significant percentage of the population was in some form of servitude. And again, we'll defer attaching meaning to that until now. Um, but when we think about slavery, we might think about these two sort of um, go-to definitions for slavery. Um, the one being the League of Nations 1926 slavery convention that defines slavery according to the classic property definition. So slavery is the status or condition of a person over whom any or all the powers attaching to the right of ownership are exercised. Well, we might also think about a more sociological definition that is that of Orlando Patterson. Slavery is the permanent violent domination of natally alienated and generally dishonored persons. And those of you who studied this distinction or studied the history of slavery know um, that this really is kind of a, a um, crucial question that remains largely unanswered. My preference is actually to put the two definitions together because I think that um, the first of them, the property definition is, a, is crucial and can't be dispensed with in a way that Patterson thought that it could um, and yet that it doesn't explain everything and that really if um, we were to simplify this to its kind of um, most crystalline form, the difference is between the perspective of master, which would be the slavery convention definition that um, they think of these humans as their property and that of the slave um, who perceives of, of the world as they experience it as one of violent domination of natal alienation and of general dishonor. And I'll just step aside from my discourse right now um, to note that, um, it, uh, so um, Kate Cooper in the sort of preliminaries to this was mentioning the fact um, that um, although tomorrow is Thanksgiving day in the United States, um, which means that I'm zooming in from away from home, uh, from away from my university um, and at my sort of Thanksgiving celebration area, um, that, that, that um, it's currently um, um, become important to some people to celebrate instead um, the Native American version of this story and do that on Fridays. So too, I think we're in this world right now, we're questioning lots of uh, received knowledge, received um, patterns um, and practices. Um, lots of people um, are very uncomfortable with the use of the word slave and prefer to talk about enslaved persons um, and uh, also master and prefer to talk about um, enslavers. Um, and I find that, that um, discourse important and try to use it when possible partly because of my age and the fact that I'm used to using the older terms, but also because um, those uh, um, circumlocutions can be awkward and not always accurate. Um, I'm going to sort of toggle between those terms and I hope not to um, upset people um, by sometimes using the word slave to describe human beings who are considered, uh, who, are, who are sort of um, lumped into this category and considered to be um, property or worthy of violent domination. Um, none of which are, are values, obviously, that I hold um, and, and do feel that um, resistance should work its way down in contemporary practice to the level of linguistic usage. So I'm, I'm begging forgiveness, as it were, as I continue. Um, so if we think about that first definition, um, we can see that there's lots of evidence that uh, we could support a, um, a approach to Visigothic slavery that considered it um, a uh, property concern. That is to say that, in other words, um, when we get to the early Middle Ages, one of the problems that we have, and this is one that Alice Rios confronted head on um, in her book, um, is the question of definitions and the question of, well, can we define these people that we're talking about with words like servi, mancipia, ancillae, family, et cetera, in the Latin sources? Can we talk about them as slaves, or are we moving to a point where servus means serf instead of slave? Um, trying to think about that in terms of the um, League of Nations charter definition, um, it, there are lots of aspects um, or instances of slavery as practice in the Visigothic world that seem to fit into um, that classic League of Nations charter definition so that the slaves are definitely saleable in the Visigothic world. Um, so I um, offer here um, formula Visigothic high. So one of the um, formulas um, that, uh, one of the few formulas that we have preserved from um, the Visigothic world, um, that definitely makes it clear that what we're talking about is a sale in which uh, the um, uh, seller is receiving the full price from which, uh, uh, from you, which appears in our agreement that is X number of solides, so a money price. 
and um, the, the slave's um, uh, transfer is then guaranteed by a series of clauses that trace back to Roman slave sale contracts, such as that this slave is not subject to any suit, nor a runaway, nor a troublemaker, nor has any vice as to his person, nor is subject to the ownership of any other person. And then almost a definition of property at the end here that says, you may from this day forward have him, hold him, possess him, claim him as property in your authority and defend him in perpetuity. And whatever you wish to do with the person of the above mentioned slave, you may have free power to do so in every respect. Which is to say that this is more or less uh, presenting us with a kind of um, textbook League of Nations Charter definition of a slave in the process of selling one human being to another person um, by a third party. So that seems fairly clear to me that we're talking about um, instances of, of you know, uh, enslavement in the Visigothic world that fit that classic property definition. And furthermore, the Liber uh, Judiciorum, or I'm referring to it as the LV, the Leges Visigothorum, um, regulates price formation, the rescission of sales uh, of slave sales, self-purchase, sale to foreigners, etc. So lots of aspects of sale. And these enslaved people can be given as gifts. They can be uh, uh, given out on mortgage. Ownership of real and chattel, chattel property can accrue to the slave owner through the slave. Obviously through rents, so you own the slave's labor product. That's the classic you know, Marxist um, definition and problem. Also, you can accrue property from um, passive acquisitions. So if the slave is given an inheritance, which happens in the Roman and apparently the Visigothic world, is given a gift, that, that property accrues to uh, the slave's owner or the enslaver, we might say. That this, the slave owner is also responsible for the delicts of that slave. Um, all these things make it look uh, fairly well as if we're dealing with instances of slavery that fit with uh, classic definitions of property. We also have a tiny clutch of um, documentary sources that indicate the same thing. So for lo a long time, we've had the, um, the will and um, uh, the uh, donation will of Vincent of Huesca. And you can see in that first uh, uh, document that I have, the first power or bullet point um, that I have, um, we get um, slaves catalog in the transfer of estates um, in a kind of blanket sense along with other pieces of property. So they kind of are attachments to property. This begins to make us wonder, well, are these really more like serfs, people who are um, able to be sold only in the context of the sale of a piece of land because they're in essence attached to that land. And in this first instance, we can see that they're sold or that they're lumped together with Coloni, um, who at least in the late Roman Empire are thought maybe to fit that definition um, quite strictly of being attached to the land. And then we have these um, new documents that have been published by Thomas Fazi and uh, Martin Iglesias um, that um, offer very similar catalogs of uh, slaves or Coloni, along with a variety of other types of property. These, um, by the way, have been recently published in 2021 by Sidney Martin um, and Juan Jose Larea in uh, a new edition. So you don't have to refer to the sort of preliminary publication by um, Tomas Fassi and uh, Martin Iglesias, but their, their document offering continues the same up to present. And in fact, um, if we look at the first of those newly discovered and newly published documents, um, we can see the instance where um, this character Gaudiosus um, is donating to the monastery of San Martin de Assan, um, where he had been a monk, 12 estates um, uh, that uh, um, he possesses in nine different territories. Sorry, it should be 11 estates um, in nine different territories. And you can see that over and over again, those are given either with Coloni or Coloniki, as they're sometimes referred to, um, or with Monkipii, or sometimes with both. So that in other words, um, Practically uh, every estate has its own attached uh, um, laborers, as it were, who are likened to the classic instrumentum of um, the um, classical Roman period, where when you sell an estate, you're expected to be selling um, or transferring um, all the things that go with it, including the barns um, and the trees and uh, the brooks and streams and the water mills and the slaves. They're a piece of the property apparatus. So, Given that I think we can all agree there's lots of evidence that these 
enslaved human beings are being treated as property in the legal sources. I mean, we might ask ourselves um, if we have an instance like Gaudiosus, who has these um, multiple uh, different um, estates on in different territories, how do they even manage all of these? And the answer is through absenteeism. We have lots of evidence uh, that there is um, absentee property management, um, much as there had been in the Roman world. So that um, uh, this comes um, to us primarily from evidence that we get in the legal sources. And um, I've seen already in the room a number of experts in um, Visigothic uh, history who know, who don't need an explanation that really the, um, the primary source that we have is this uh, Legis Visigothorum. Um, and we have a number of other sources, but we're very scant um, on uh, especially documentary sources, but really also on narrative sources too. Um, so we're stuck trying to arrive at conclusions based above all on the normative sources, but they tell us things that um, slaves may testify in cases arising on properties where they dwelt if no other person of freeborn status was near enough to be able to bear witness. So we might have an entire piece of property where there's only enslaved people on it um, that's being managed also by probably enslaved people. Um, that the finders of runaway slaves must return them not to the master necessarily if he happens to be far away, but to the manager of any estate um, on of his rather that might be closer um, sorry, that might be closer to the fine spot. So if the, the owner of the estate is miles and miles away, um, you can simply return a runaway slave to his nearest neighboring estate. Also that um, suits where an individual has taken control of another's property, sold it or developed it without the knowledge or consent of the owner are very common. So it's clear that it's easy enough to just start uh, encroaching on someone else's land simply because that person's not around to manage their own land. And so we have to manage that through the law. And we get this in one of our few narrative sources. So the life of Protuosus, um, we hear about how when he's a child still, he travels with his father um, in order to visit his pasture, the father's pasture lands there and receive an accounting of his property. So occasionally you go up to visit your estates, um, but you don't necessarily have time for that very often. Um, that said, we also have plenty of evidence that slavery operates um, as a system of violence. And that therefore it fits into this Patterson definition as well. Sometimes that comes through um, simple mundane forms of aggression, like the simple forcible renaming of these human beings, which we're used to, again, from a classical Roman context, that you can call your slave whatever you want, regardless of what they've been called in the past, regardless of what they want to call themselves. This is, of course, of course characteristic of enslaving societies globally. And here you're going to start seeing that I have some mixes of Latin and uh, English, because I didn't take the time to translate um, some of the Latin that I'm using. There is no good translation available necessarily. Um, but you can see from that first instance that Isidore says, you know, well, we uh, feel completely comfortable um, giving names to our slaves and to our estates according to what we want, you know, whatever pleases us, we call them that. That's obviously a form of aggression. You can only imagine if someone told you you had to change your name because they claimed ownership over you. But more spectacularly, we get lots of instances of the torture of slaves, especially by whipping, often in prescribed numbers of lashes. So 50 to 100 lashes, depending on the offense that you've committed, which is a huge number, you know, potentially threatening to your life. Through this um, peculiar punishment that is de calvatio, that is to say, um, either scalping or a bad haircut. Um, there are, I think, extremists on one side who would say that literally you're removing part of the flesh of uh, the, the sort of scalp and other people who would say that you're um, simply giving someone a standout you know, bad hair day or a series of bad hair days um, in order to punish them, usually for major offenses, but this tends to happen much more to slaves than it does to freeborn persons. We're gonna talk in a minute about the fact that it can happen to freeborn persons as well. And then um, um, most gruesomely burning alive for the most extreme offenses, but generally reserved for enslaved people for things like robbing tombs or raping freeborn virgins or widows um, or male slaves who have sexual relations with a female owner. There are some uh, state and church protections against violence against slaves on the part of their enslavers. So slave owners are, for example, forbidden to extract slaves from a church where they seek asylum. 
um, that they, um, and we'll get, uh, read an instance of that in the next slide. There are protections against unjust enslavement of freeborn individuals. So that's not really protections against slaves as such, but it is um, trying to ensure that a distinction is made between freeborn and um, unfree. There are protections against the rape and sexual abuse of enslaved women, which is criminalized for anyone but the master. Never says anything about the master and the sources, and I think we can assume that, um, as in so many societies, that um, male enslavers um, felt completely justified about um, raping or sexually abusing their female slaves. Um, probably less so their male slaves in Visigothic society because um, any form of um, homosexual intercourse um, is um, punishable by burning alive. So, so, and that doesn't matter whether you're free or slave. And so it's something that the Visigoths seem very much to be interested in um, preventing. Um, then also there are a series of you know, mitigating uh, pronouncements that are made by Chindaswind and his son Rechiswind um, that do things like forbid mutilation of the face or hands of your slave without a judicial hearing. So you can still do this, um, but only if you conduct a formal judicial hearing, you can't just take it upon yourself um, to mutilate that slave's um, person. Also that forbid the killing of an enslaved person without a judicial hearing. You can see that um, um, I've got the wretch uh, under forbids killing. I've got wretch and erv and egika. That's because um, those of you in the know know that there are multiple recensions of these codes. They're really living documents and, and they get altered and they get added to and changed. And on this very question of slave killing, um, the source goes back and forth um, to where um, Retchiswind introduces this law forbidding the slave killing. And then um, the, the next uh, person who issues a, a sort of formal um, recension of the code, Ervig, rescinds that. And then Egeka reinstates it. Um, so masters are not entirely willing to eliminate um, from their repertoire of um, violent instruments against their enslaved personnel and the possibility of killing them. Um, it's something that's up for debate and something that various kings are going to support or, or not support, depending. And um, slaves are even granted a right to testify in court. We've already talked about the fact that that, except for royal slaves, and we'll talk about in a minute, that tends to be because um, those slaves um, live on an estate where there are no freeborn people around who could testify otherwise. Um, so in, in fairly limited instances, but slaves are given um, this kind of um, positive legal personality in some limited instances. Um, then I quote from the um, uh, law concerning the damages owed by someone who removes a person from a church, because it tells us something that will lead to the next slide, and I'll just read this. If someone violently removes from altars his slave or debtor who was not handed over to him by a priest or the guardians of the church, if he is a person of more honorable status, at the place where a report was first made to a judge about him, let him be compelled to pay 100, 100 solidi for the altar for which he showed so little concern. And if he is a person of lower status, let him give 30 solidi. But if he does not have the money to make this composition, let him be arrested by the judge and receive 100 blows of the whip in the meeting place in Conventu. But let the owner excuse the slave or the creditor, his debtor, and receive him back. So the church is therefore going to act as a kind of mediator between a slave who's feeling persecuted by the enslaver um, and uh, that enslaver. Um, and that enslaver is then forbidden to extract the slave from the church without some kind of agreement being reached between them. If that happens, though, that person will receive penalties on a kind of tripartite scale. So if they're of the highest status, they pay 100 solidi. If they're of a lower status, they pay 30 solidi. If they're of so low a, an economic status that they can't even afford that, they have to suffer the blows of a whip. And we start to get at a world that looks like, well, what's the difference between a slave and a free person if violent domination is also a feature of the treatment of uh, unenslaved people? And that's because in Visigothic society, and again, for all of us, I think this will come as a little surprise, there's really a spectrum of statuses. There is not um, uh, just sort of uh, free and slave as the classic Roman distinction would have us believe, even though we also know that the Roman um, Roman society claims to only have these two distinctions, but it too has status gradations. But this is overt in the Visigothic normative sources so that we have the distinction between a Goth and a Roman. We also have this distinction that we saw in the previous um, um, 
uh, slide between a more powerful person and a lesser person or a more honorable person um, and a cheaper person, as it were. And then we have a series of unfree statuses that include Coloni or Coloniki, who are very scantily attested, by the way, in the legal sources. Um, they do, as I showed you, they show up in these new documents um, that have been discovered, but um, they tend to be very scanty, um, so much so that an argument has been made that the Visigoths essentially did away with this status. And there's nothing in the normative sources that indicates what the difference is in the treatment between, say, a colonist and other unfree people, but the, the status seems to have continued to exist. There are also then freed people, liberty, but these people, um, as with classic uh, Roman slaves, if they're freed, they owe obsequium, um, they um, owe some sort of obedience to their former master, to their patron. But in Visigothic society, this becomes a kind of permanent condition and even a heritable status, first for ecclesiastical slaves, um, and then later for, it seems, all slaves owe um, an ongoing obedience that, again, turns them into something between slave and free um, that that's, looks, tastes, and feels a lot like serfs. And then we have slaves themselves, Servi and Mancipia, who come in a variety of forms as well. So the highest level slaves would be the Servi Dominici or the Servi Regis, the people who are owned by the king and who apparently, if you have this title, um, you are very close to the person of the king as a, um, a stable master or a groom, we could say, as a gilonarius, as a person um, who, uh, uh, an argentarius, so a person in charge of the um, a cup bearer slave or a um, uh, probably moneyer slave or a cook. We also then have servi fiscales who are also owned by the crown as it were, but perform bureaucratic functions like tax collection or conscription. Then we have servi idonii, something that definitely does not exist in Roman society. So we might think of um, these first two categories as akin to imperial slaves in classical uh, Roman law, but servi idonii don't exist in classical Roman law. And here, um, idonio seems to mean something like reputable, and distinctions are made between, say, the punishments that are doled out to a servus idoneus um, and a servus inferior, or simply a servus. So you'd want to be one of these reputable slaves if you could. There are also slaves uh, of the church. And as I indicated, um, they are the first slaves for whom manumission becomes incredibly difficult, primarily because the church is considered to be their owner and never really dies. Um, and so the church tries to believe that it can maintain control of its slave body in perpetuity, which means that generation to generation, it's very difficult for slaves to come free from that. And then servi inferioris or videoris or rusticani are the lowest grade of slaves who might be your average field slave. But as I already indicated, violent domination is not unique to these enslaved persons. So free persons can be whipped, usually with half as many strokes as a slave could be. So here I quote from the title against, uh, um, one of the delict titles uh, against cutting down or burning a fence that says in the bolded parts, um, if the person who does this is of higher station, they shall both repair the fence and make a reparation for the damage. So they get rel relatively light punishment. Then the next bolded part, but if a person of lower station does this, they shall pay the damage of the assessed fruits, repair the fence and receive 50 lashes in public. So they're going to perform the, the act of repairing the damage they've done, but then also receive 50 lashes. But if a slave does this without the knowledge of his owner, he shall pay the damage, repair the fence and receive 100 lashes. So twice as many blows as the, uh, as the um, uh, free person of low status. And in fact, that sort of doubling or halving, depending, um, seems to be uh, baked into the cake for the Visigoths. They um, think of people in these status gradations, um, and in those status gradations, a slave seems to have about half the worth of a human, so that um, in the next law, you can see if a freeborn man kills a slave, not intentionally, but in the various cases described above, half of the composition that has been established in the case of the free, of freeborn men must be restored. So you, you owe money if you kill a free person, you owe half as much if you kill a slave. And this is, of course, because of the principle of Vergil. And again, I don't think I need to explain what that means. 
But what I do think people haven't acknowledged two things. First of all, is that um, um, the people who were at my conference last week, um, and I know that Roger Collins in the room, I know that Alice Rio who gave a paper um, that they were present at that conference. Um, and they will have heard that I'm um, just not willing to surrender the idea of um, Germanic law because I actually think it's useful. And here's an excellent example of where I think it's useful. Um, that I truly believe there is this principle of Vergel that shows up all over, we all know, um, in these um, post-Roman law codes. Um, and that this is an extremely important um, instrument for um, extrusive enslavement. So uh, Orlando Patterson talks about intrusive and extrusive um, enslavement. And they, the notion is kind of counterintuitive, but intrusive enslavement is when you intrude on another society, capture their people, and make them your slaves. Extrusive enslavement is where you take people within your own society and you extrude them from full participation in that society by turning them into slaves. Bear Guild functions to do that in these post-Roman societies. Um, and I, I do believe that Bear Guild is a, a uniquely Germanic idea um, and that it happens over and over again in the code. So you can see I've got this catalog far too long to read, but this um, is many, uh, most of the instances where you can be enslaved for committing some sort of crime or delict. And the distinction there is very fuzzy in these Germanic societies and Visigothic society um, as well, the difference between a crime and a delict. And I'm happy to talk about um, why I think that's important that there even be a distinction um, and why it's important that it's hard to find in these um, Germanic law codes. So over and over again, in other words, the judicial system is used as a way to enslave people. You, they do something wrong and you enslave them. One of the great papers that we saw at the Visigothic conference that um, I hosted last weekend um, um, demonstrated the way that this is done um, in the later Middle Ages, um, almost on a kind of contract basis. So people who are rich property owners become very skilled at using the administrative system in order to turn people into their serfs at this point, um, because they, they have a lot more protections that make them a little a bit less like uh, the, these enslaved people in Visigothic society. But in other words, you can capitalize on the legal system in order to generate slaves for yourself. And often this happens because as we've seen, um, the compensations, the compositions um, for offenses um, usually involve the payment of some sort of money amount. But then when that money amount can't be paid, Different things happen. Sometimes you have to suffer physical punishment. Sometimes you accrue debts. And as those debts grow, you can actually then convert yourself into a sort of um, a collateral on your debts um, and let your creditors, as it were, capitalize on that by enslaving you. Um, and here I have um, this sort of loan guarantee where someone um, is basically putting their body out um, uh, for the possibility that you can be um, enslaved first by, in this instance, in form of the Visigothic eye, um, by uh, um, uh, saying that um, if you fail to pay off your debts, um, that this will be turned over to an exactor, to a creditor exe or executor, sorry, um, a credit uh, um, sort of um, a um, uh, credit agency that's going to, or a Christian agent who's going to um, work to extract a loan from you in double the amount that you had owed before you defaulted. And that then when you default um, and you can't even pay that amount, it could be that what you have to do is convert yourself into a slave through self-sale. So here the bolded part um, of this Visigothic formula, but um, whenever th this is, by the way, a formula that let's read down um, the bullet point list here. Um, um, when in Visigothic law, um, you look up in the Legis Visigothorum or its predecessor, the Code of Uruk, whether you can sell yourself. It says, no, you can't sell yourself, but then it appears to contradict itself as to whether you can do that. And that's the contrast. And then the end, um, if you look those up, you'll see that there's tension in the statute law about this, but this formula is the workaround. So that um, it, it acknowledges that there is a statutory um, law against selling yourself, but then it says, but whenever someone while holding control of his own status seems to suffer necessity or some misery because of legal, a legal case and is compelled by his case to render judgment concerning how he wishes his status to be, whether to improve it or worsen it, 
he should have free authority to do so. Therefore, having properly considered this on my own, I have proposed to sell my status. So this is um, obviously the indebted person who is admitting, I know that um, I am by statute not allowed to sell myself, but I'm a free person and I should have the free choice even to sell myself and therefore I chose to do that. I signal here um, Hannah Barker's marvelous um, resource for uh, medieval slavery, medievalslavery.org, um, where I did translations of the Visigothic material on uh, the, the formula material on um, uh, enslavement, but there's stuff globally and there's stuff uh, between the fourth and the 17th century um, on that website. So if you're interested in teaching slavery, please, uh, in, in the Middle Ages, please go to that site. Hannah's just doing super stuff all around about this question. Um, so uh, now we finally get to violence here, 35 minutes into my lecture, although we've been dealing with violence all along, right? So violence in order to maintain your slaves, violence to gain ownership of your slaves. But let's talk a little bit more about slaves as agents of violence. Um, and one of the ways that slaves are not just um, uh, the objects of violence, but also subjects um, inflicting violence on others is that Visigothic slaves are regularly used in military actions. And this we know from Legis Visigothorum 9.2.9, um, a law of Ervig, so um, a, a late version of the code um, that says that whoever is going to march out in the army should bring a tenth part of his slaves with him on a military expedition when he comes. And he should do it in such a way that this 10th part of his slaves is not unarmed, but it should show up outfitted with various sorts of arms and it lists those arms. That's interesting because we know, for example, that the Romans also brought slaves with them, soldiers brought slaves with them, but they seem never to have been given arms if at all possible. And instead they're made to you know, help, help uh, put up your tent um, or to uh, take out your chamber pot in the morning or to polish your arms or things like that, but they're not used as combatants. It's clear that these Visigothic slaves are. And furthermore, that even though um, this is an Arabic law, so very late in the tradition already um, in the Codex of Uruk at 323, the same phenomenon is there that you're using um, enslaved people, people enslaved to you as part of your combat retinue. Also, slaves are used as agents of violence, and we've kind of seen hints of this when we've looked at laws that said if the master um, did not ask the slave to commit this crime, then the slave needs to be punished with this. But there's a different assessment against the master if the master actually put the slave up to committing the crime or delict. I've tried to steer us when possible to these, as I say, scanty uh, narrative sources, including um, Valerius of Bierzo's Ordo Querimoniae, on which there's a great article by Roger Collins, um, this and the other sources where we hear of Valerius's story. Um, where Valerius is given, so Valerius is uh, um, this uh, ascetic um, who uh, takes up residence on the property of this lord named Ricamer. Um, and other folks want to help him, but Ricamer seems intent on basically um, either at best turning him into a, a sort of parish priest, as it were, for a church that um, Rickmer wants, and uh, at worst, just sort of eliminating him from the scene. Um, Valerius is given two horses or mules or asses. The words are uh, of huge jumble in um, the Ordo Ceremonia. We don't really know what he's given because sometimes they're cabali and um, sometimes they're um, evectiones, uh, different words. By the Vir Illustrissimus Basvianus, and Valerius turned those over to one of his deacons named Johannes. Then a lord, it doesn't name him in this source, but it's certainly this guy, Rickamer, who owns the property on which his monastery is located, sends persons to steal one of the animals. They fail, and when they get back to their own land, they realize a hailstorm has struck, of course, sent by God, and destroy their crops so they don't know how they're going to survive. These thieves then attempt to take vengeance by throwing Valerius's cattle into a nearby canyon. God comes to the rescue once again and saves the cattle so none of them dies. But then, inflamed by the devil, they send another person to murder Johannes the deacon. So we have these slaves who are kind of working at the bidding of this kind of ne'er-do-well uh, senior, this ne'er-do-well property owner. Um, and eventually, they escalate their conflict um, with Valerius as property manager um, to the point that they murder him. Also, slaves can be deployed for the conduct of theft. So um, we hear in the lives of the fathers of Merida, 
um, that this character Nepopus has been appointed to the See of Merida as an Arian bishop when King, King Leovigild, who is the sort of last of the, the um, uh, ardent Arian kings of the Visigoths, he wants the bishop there to convert Masona. Masona is resisting. So he appoints a kind of um, replacement. When Nepopus then returns to his home city because he's gotten kicked out later on, he enlists the church slaves to help him steal all the church silver on wagons and carry it out of the city where he intends to keep that and the slaves as well. So he's saying, you know, well, that, that church property um, that, that was mine for a while, it's gonna stay mine. I'm not giving it back even though I have to surrender the church back to Masona. Masona finds the wagons and learns that the slaves are upset because they're being forced to leave their wives and children and go into exile with Nepopus. And so Masona puts a stop to this theft. And so this is a kind of uh, tragedy averted, um, but it's conducted per homines meritensis ecclesiae. Are they slaves? Are they other forms of dependence? They're clearly people who are attached somehow, humans who are attached to the church in precisely what function we don't know. At a minimum, we do know that they're being enlisted in order to, to perform uh, violent or uh, criminal acts on behalf of a person who claims uh, mastery or ownership over them. There um, is also evidence that the enslaved people resisted this themselves, that they weren't necessarily interested in cooperating with their slave owners, their enslavers. Um, and that comes in a variety of forms Particularly, um, they are uh, inclined toward theft, we could say. And this is a common charge that's leveled against slaves. And the fact is that slaves, um, enslaved people probably are regularly guilty of theft insofar as their entire person has been stolen by another human being. And if they can you know, get an extra chicken to feed themselves uh, or take something of value from the person who's enslaving them and sell it, why wouldn't they? You know, they live in a world that, from their perspective, is lawless, and they will uh, uh, gladly sow havoc um, in the world of their enslaver as well. So that we get, for example, on one of the Visigothic slates, one of our, um, you know, the, the um, Visigothic equivalent of the papyri are these slates um, that have various um, documentary attestations on them. And one of them is a letter from the estate owner Faustinus to his manager Paulus, ordering him to make sure that his slaves swore an oath not to cheat him in the collection of the olive harvest and to steal the transport containers to minimize corruption. So in other words, um, the owner knows this is going to happen and he wants the slaves to take an oath of it. It won't happen. Whether that worked is questionable. And they flee, which is a classic problem with slaves. In this world where everyone is swimming in an ocean of slaves, I think it's probably very difficult to get away from enslavement altogether, um, but that you would flee from one master to another probably to get a better deal if you could, or sometimes because you'd fallen in love with um, the uh, a person who was enslaved on another piece of property and you prefer to spend your life there for any number of reasons you try to get away from your enslaver. And so we have all kinds of rules to limit the number of days that one can host an unknown visitor on your property, to require that inquiry be made into that person's identity, to arrest and interrogate people if they appear to be fugitives, to protect those who failed to hold fugitives despite using chains and ropes, to reward those who returned fugitives. And you actually have to pay those people who bring your fugitive slaves back one train misses for every 30 miles they travel to get to you. It's in essence for a, 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 a one train misses for about every day of travel that they make to return your slave to you. And we also have instances um, of violence being perpetrated by slaves against the master. And here I quote uh, from the, again, Lives of the Fathers of Merida about Nantus the abbot, who comes from Africa to the city of Merida in the time of Leovigil. And then when Leovigil learns that he's living in poverty, he as king insists that Nantus receive the gift of a piece of property from the royal estates. When the laborers on that estate, on his estate, then see Nantos pasturing sheep like a commoner, they choose to break his neck. The Ovigel arrests them, puts them in chains, arraigns them on murder. Then, for whatever reason, we don't know, he frees them, um, but uh, with, with the um, assumption that God will punish them if they deserve it. And of course, um, God lives up to that um, and kills all of them. They're afflicted with demons and die. 
Um, but the fact that we can think of these people as uh, enslaved to or regarding themselves as slaves of Nantos for that brief period when they are comes in the bolded part in the Latin here where he says um, they, they complain. You know, they look at this guy who is a classic uh, ascetic um, and does not look uh, lordly enough in their eyes and say, Melius es nobis mori quam tali domino servire. Um, so um, he's not exerting enough masterly influence or demonstrating his masterliness sufficiently to impress them uh, that they need to serve him and instead they choose um, to murder him. So it does give us some idea also about the dynamic between lord and slave and the way that uh, the enslaved people, um, as they do across the globe, that there has to be a power dynamic in which this, the enslaved person themselves acknowledges um, without you know, accepting or appreciating um, or um, giving full validity to, but acknowledges that this person has masterly control over me. And there's, for the moment, at least there's nothing I can do about it. But in this moment, there's something you can do about it and you take advantage of it and break your master's neck. Um, so I'm going to leave it there.